When he arrived at the entrance hall at eight o'clock that night, he found an unusually large number of girls lurking there, all of whom seemed to be staring at him resentfully as he approached Luna. She was wearing a set of spangled silver robes that were attracting a certain amount of giggles from the onlookers, but otherwise she looked quite nice. Harry was glad in any case that she left her radish earrings, her butterbeer cork necklace, and her spec spectrospects. Hi, he said. Shall we get going then? Oh, yes, she said happily. Where is the party? Slughorn's office, said Harry, leading up to the marble staircase, away from all the staring and muttering. Did you hear? There's supposed to be a vampire coming? Rufus Scrimger, said Luna. I, what? <laughs> said Harry, disconcerted. You mean the Minister of Magic? Yes, he's a vampire said Luna matter-of-factly. Father wrote a very long article about it when Scrimger first took office over Cornelius Fudge, but he was forced to not publish by somebody from the ministry. Obviously, they didn't want the truth to get out. Harry, who thought it was most unlikely that Rufus Scrimger was a vampire, but who had used, was used to Luna repeating her father's bizarre views as though they were fact. They did not reply. They were already approaching Slughorn's office, and the sounds of laughter, music, and loud conversations were growing louder with every step they took. Whether it had been built that way, or because he had uh, used magical trickery to make it so, Slughorn's office was much larger than the usual teacher's study. The ceilings and walls had been draped with emerald, crimson, and gold hangings so that it looked as though they were all inside a vast tent. The room was crowded and stuffy and bathed in red light cast by ornate golden lamps dangling from the center of the ceilings in which real fairies were fluttering, each a brilliant speck of light. Loud singing accompanied by the sound, what sounded like medallions issued from a distant corner. A haze of pipe smoke hung over several elderly warlocks deep in conversation. Any number of house elves were negotiating their way squeakily through the forest of knees obscured by very heavy silver platters of food that they were bearing, so that they looked like little rowing tables. Aww. <laughs> Harry, my boy, <laughs> boomed Slughorn, almost as soon as Harry and Luna squeezed through the door. Come in, come in, so many people I'd like you to meet. Slughorn was wearing a tasseled velvet hat that matched his smoking jacket. Gripping Harry's arm so tightly he might have been uh, hoping to disapparate with him, Slughorn led him purposefully into the party. Harry seized Luna's hand and dragged her along with him. Harry, I'd like you to meet Eldred Warple, an old student of mine, author of Blood Brothers, My Life Amongst the Vampires, and of course his friend Seguini. Warple, who was a small, stout, bespeckled man, grabbed Harry's hand and shook it enthusiastically. The vampire Seguini who was tall and emaciated with dark shadows under his eyes, merely nodded. He looked rather bored. A gaggle of girls who... A gaggle of girls was standing close to him, looking curious and excited. Harry Potter, I am so delighted, said Warble, peering short-sightedly up to Harry's face. I was saying to Professor Slughorn only the other day, where is that biography of Harry Potter for which we have all been waiting? Er, uh, said Harry, were you? <laughs> Just the modest as Horace described, said Warble. Uh, but seriously, he, his manner changed and become suddenly businesslike. I would be delighted to write it myself. People are craving to know more about you, dear boy, craving. If you were prepared to grant me a few interviews, say in four or five hour sessions, why, we could have that book finished within months and all with very little effort on your part. I assure you, ask Sagini here. If it isn't quite, Sagini, stay here, added Warble, suddenly stern, for the vampire had edged toward the nearby group of girls, a rather hungry look in his eyes. 
Here, have a pasty, said Warble, seizing one from a passing elf and stuffing it into Swagini's hand before turning his attention back to Harry. My dear boy, the gold you could make, you have no idea. I'm definitely not interested, <laughs> Harry said firmly, and I've just seen a friend of mine. Sorry. <laughs> he pulled Luna after him to into the crowd. He had indeed just seen a long mane of brown hair just disappearing between what looked like two members of the Weird Sisters. Hermione, Hermione, Harry, there you are. Thank goodness. Hi, Luna. What happened to you? asked Harry, for Hermione looked distinctively disheveled, rather as though she had just fought her way out of the thickest of Devil's Snare. Oh, I've just escaped. I mean, I just left Cormac, she said under the mistletoe. She added an explanation as Harry continued to look questioningly at her. Served you right for Brick coming with him, he said severely. I thought he'd annoy Ron the most, said Hermione dispassionately. I debated for a while about Zachari Zachariah Smith, but I thought on the whole, you considered Smith, Harry said revolted. Yes, I did, and I'm starting to wish I'd chosen him. McLagan look makes Grop look like a gentleman. Let's get out of the... Oh, let's go this way. We'll be able to see him coming. He's so tall. The three of them made their way over to the other side of the room, scooping up goblets of mead on the way, realizing too late that Professor Twinalni was standing there alone. Hello, said Luna politely to Professor Twinalni. Good evening, my dear, said Professor Twinalni, focusing upon Luna with some difficulty. Harry could smell cooking sherry again. I haven't seen you in my class lately. No, I've got frenzier this year. Oh, of course, said Professor Tonalny in an angry, drunken twitter. Oh, Dobbin, as I prefer to think of him, you would have thought, would you not, that now I'm returned to school that Professor Dumbledore might have gotten rid of, uh, rid of the horse. But no... We share classes. It's an insult, frankly, an insult. Do you know? Professor Tonalny seemed too tipsy to have recognized Harry. Under the cover of her furious crimson of uh, forensi, Harry drew closer to Hermione and said, Let's get something straight. Are you planning to tell Ron that you interfered at Keeper's tryouts? Hermione raised her eyebrows. Do you really think I'd stoop that low? Harry looked at her shrewdly. Hermione, if you ask out McLagan, there's a difference, said Hermione distinctly. I've got no plans to tell Ron anything about what might or might not have happened at Keeper's tryouts. Um, good, said Harry fervently, because he'll just fall apart again and we'll lose next match. Quidditch! said Hermione angrily. Is that all you boys care about? Cormac hasn't asked me one single question about myself. No, I've just been treated to an a hundred great saves by McCormack, uh, Cormac McLagan non, nonstop ever since. Uh-oh, here he comes. She moved so fast <laughs> as though she had disapparated. <laughs> one moment she was there, the next she squeezed between two gua uh Gaffying witches and vanished. Seen Hermione, said McLacken, forcing his way through the throng a minute later. No, sorry, said Harry, as he turned quickly to join Luna's conversation, forgetting for a split second to whom she was talking. Oh, Potter, said Chodolny in a deep, vibrant tone, noticing him for the first time. Oh, hello, said Harry unenthusiastically. My dear boy, she said in a very carrying whisper, the rumors, the stories, the chosen one. Of course, I've known for a very long time. The omens were never good, Harry. But why have you not returned to divinations for you of all people? The subject is of the utmost importance. Oh, Sybil, we all think our subjects most important said in a loud voice the slughorn appeared at professor tonalny's other side his face very red his uh, velvet hat a little askew and a glass of mead in one hand and an enormous 
mince pie in the other. But I don't think I've ever known such a natural at potion, said Slughorn, regarding Harry with a fond, if bloodshot eye. Instinctive, you might know, like his mother, if only ever taught a few with his kind of ability. I tell you that, Sybil, why even Severus, and to Harry's horror, <laughs> Slughorn threw out an arm and seemed to scoop Snape out of the air towards them. Stop skulping, uh, skulking and come and join us, Severus, hiccuped Slughorn happily. I was just talking about Harry's exceptional potion making. Some credit must go to you, of course. You taught him for five years. Trapped with Slughorn's arm around his shoulder, Snape looked down his hooked nose at Harry and his black eyes narrowed. Funny. I never had the impression that I managed to teach Potter anything at all. <laughs> well, then, it's natural ability! <laughs> Shouted Slughorn. <laughs> you should have seen what he gave me. First lesson, draught of living death, had never had a student produce a finer on first attempt. I don't think even you, Severus, really said Snape quietly, his eyes still boring into Harry, who felt a certain disquiet. The last thing he wanted was for Snape to start investigating the source of his newfound brilliance of potions. Remind me what other subjects you're taking, Harry, said Slughorn. Defense against the dark arts, charms, transfiguration, herbology, all the subjects acquired in short for an aura, said Snape with a faintest sneer. Yeah, well, that's what I'd like to do, said Harry defiantly. And a great one you'll make, too, boomed Slughorn. I don't think you should be an Auror, Harry, said Luna unexpectedly. Everybody looked at her. The Aurors are part of a Rotfang conspiracy. I thought everyone knew that. They're working to bring down the Ministry of Magic from within the combination of dark magic and gum disease. <laughs> Harry inhaled half his mead up his nose <laughs> as he started to laugh. Really? <laughs> it would have been worth bringing Luna just for this. Emerging from the goblet, coughing, sopping wet, but still grinning, he saw something calculated to raise his spirits even higher. Draco Malfoy being dragged by the ear towards, Argus, or towards them by Argus Filch. Professor Slughorn, wheezed Filch his jowls a quiver in the medical light of mischief detection in his bulging eyes i discovered this boy lurking in the upstairs corridor he claims to have been invited to your party to have been delayed in setting out did you issue him an invitation malfoy pulled himself free of filch's grip looking furious all right i wasn't invited he said angrily i was just trying to gate crash happy no i'm not said Filch, a statement of complete odds with a glee on his face. You're in trouble, you are. Didn't the headmaster say that nighttime prowling's out? Unless you've got permission, didn't he, eh? That's all right, Argus. That's all right, said Slughorn. Waving a hand, it's Christmas, and it's not a crime to want to come to a party. Just this once, we'll forget any punishments. You may stay, Draco. Filch's expression of outrage, outrage disappointment was perfectly predictable, but Harry, but why, Harry wondered, watching him, did Malfoy look almost equally unhappy, and why was Snape looking at Malfoy as though both angry and, was it possible, a little afraid? But almost before Harry had registered what he had seen, Filch had turned and shuffled away, muttering under his breath. Malfoy had composed his face into a smile and was thanking Slughorn for his generosity. And Snape's face was smooth, smoothly incrutable, inscrutable again. It's nothing, nothing, said Slughorn, waving away Malfoy's thanks. Did you know your grandfather, after all... Oh, I did know your grandfather, after all. He always spoke very highly of you, sir, said Malfoy quickly. 
said you were the best potion maker he'd ever seen, ever known. Harry stared at Malfoy. It was, n it was not the sucking up that intrigued him. He had watched Malfoy do that to Snape for a long time. It was the fact that Malfoy did, after all, look a little ill. This was the first time he had seen Malfoy close up for ages. He now saw that Malfoy had dark shadows under his eyes and a distinctively grayish tinge to his skin. I'd like a word with you, Draco, Snape, uh, said Snape suddenly. Oh, now Severus, said Slughorn, hiccuping. It's Christmas. Don't be too hard. I'm his head of house. I shall decide how hard or otherwise to be, said Snape curtly. Follow me, Draco. They left, Snape leading the way, Malfoy looking resentful. Harry stood there for a moment, irresolute, and said, I'll be back in a bit, Luna. Er, bathroom. All right, she said cheerfully, and he thought he heard her as he hurried off into the crowd. Resumed the subject of the Rot Fang conspiracy with Professor Trinalny, who seemed sincerely Inter interested. It was easy, once out of the party, to pull his invisibility cloak out of his pocket and throw it over himself, for the corridor was quite deserted. What was more difficult was finding Snape and Malfoy. Harry ran down the corridor, the, nose of his feet, the noise of his feet, masked by the music and loud talk still issuing from Slughorn's office, behind him. Perhaps Snape had taken Malfoy to his office in the dungeons, or perhaps escorting him back to the Slytherin common room. Harry pressed his ear against the door after door, and he dashed down the corridor until, with a great jolt of excitement, he crouched down to the keyhole at last classroom in the corridor and heard voices. Cannot afford mistakes, Draco, because if you are expelled, I didn't have anything to do with it, all right? I hope you're telling the truth, because it is both clumsy and foolish. Already you are suspected to have a hand in it. Who suspects me, said Malfoy angrily, for the last time. I didn't do it, okay? The bell girl must have been had an enemy no one knows about. Don't look at me like that. I know what you're doing. I'm not stupid, but it won't work. I can stop you. But there, there was a pause, and then Snape said quietly, Ah, Aunt Bellatrix has been teaching you occlumency, I see. What thoughts are you hiding to conceal from your master, Draco? I'm not trying to conceal anything from him. I just don't want you butting in. Harry pressed his ear still more closely against the keyhole. What, he, what had happened to make Malfoy speak to Snape like this? Snape, towards whom he had always shown respect even liking so what is it why you have so that is why you've been avoiding me this term you have feared my interference you realize that had anybody else failed to come to my office when i had told them repeatedly to be there draco so put me in detention report me to dumbledore jared malfoy there was another pause then snape said you know perfectly well that i do not wish to do either of those things you better stop telling me to come to your office then. Listen to me, said Snape, his voice in a low, now low that Harry had to push his ear very hard against the keyhole to hear. I am trying to help you. I swore to your mother I would protect you. I made the unbreakable vow. Looks like you'll have to break it then because I don't need your protection. It's my job. He gave it to me and I'm doing it. I've got a plan and it's going to work. It's just taking a bit longer than I thought it would. What is your plan? It's none of your business. If you tell me what you're trying to do, I can assist you. I've got all the assistance I need. Thanks. I'm not alone. You were certainly alone tonight, which was foolish in the extreme, wandering the corridors without lookouts or backup. These are elementary mistakes. I would have had Crab and Goyle with me if you hadn't put them in detention. Keep your voice down, spat Snape, for Malfoy's voice had risen excitingly. If your friends, Crab and Goyle, intended to pass their defense against the dark arts, OWL, this time around, they need to work a little harder than they are doing at present. 
What does it matter, said Malfoy. Defense against the dark arts? It's just a joke, isn't it? An act. Like any of us need to protect our, uh, need protection against the dark arts. It is an act that is crucial to your success, Draco, said Snape. Where do you think I would have been all these years if I had not known how to act? Now listen to me. You're being incautious, wandering around at night, getting yourself caught, and if you're placing your rel uh, reliance and assistance like Crab and Goyle, they're not the only ones. I've got other people on my side, better people. Then why not confide in me? I can... I know what you're up to. You want to steal my glory. There's another pause. Then Snape said coldly, you are speaking like a child. I quite understand that your father's capture and imprisonment has upset you, but Harry had barely a second's warning. He heard Malfoy's footsteps on the other side of the door, swung himself out of the way just as it burst open. Malfoy was striding away down the corridor, past the open door to Slughorn's office, around the distant corner, and out of sight. Hardly daring to breathe, Harry remained crouched down as Snape emerged slowly from the classroom, his expression unfathomable. He returned to the party. Harry remained on the floor, hiding beneath the cloak, his mind racing. Have a good day, guys.